everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. In today's video, we'll be hitting another video in my cultural examination series and taking a look at an often requested culture, that of the lost nation of Malkir. This video is actually brought to you by one of my patrons, Urien Stonebow. He's a member of my Patreon at the chosen level, and part of his perks for being at that level is he gets to pick the topic for a video, and this was his pick. It's a great topic, and I've had a lot of fun researching it and making some cool maps just for this video. If you'd like to sponsor your own video, please check out my Patreon. The link is down in the description of the video. That is the best way that you can support the channel. Thanks again to Urian, and thanks to all of you who already support me. Now, before getting into the meat of the video, let's go ahead and throw up a spoiler warning. This video will carry a spoiler rating of red, with spoilers running all the way through the final book of the series, Memory of Light. There are going to be lots of spoilers for backstory and history, and there are going to be some things that will spoil the main sequence of the story as well. Please watch this video with caution if you have not finished A Memory of Light. You have been warned. So if you've seen one of my cultural examinations before, I always follow the same format with these, and I try to be thorough. I'm going to break down the examination into 10 sections to kind of sort of organize things. And those sections are as follows. History, demographics and culture, geography, economy, governmental structure and law, military, overall power, significant landmarks, significance to the story, and what happens after the books. So let's go ahead and jump right in to my cultural examination of Malkir. The history of the nation of Malkir dates all the way back to the breaking of the world. In the aftermath of the breaking, as people began to settle down and the White Tower was being founded, a people came together and formed the nation of Aramella. Aramella was one of the largest nations at the time, and the queen of Aramella, Mabriam in Sharid, who was also an Aes Sedai, she played a major role in forging the Compact of the Ten Nations, which united the ten major nations of the Westlands in a mutual defense pact against the Shadow, and this happened in the year 209 after breaking. The territory for Aramella was vast and extended from the Mountains of Doom all the way to the Black Hills and almost to parts of modern Andor. The area that would become Malkir was completely a part of Aramella and sat on the border with the Blight. Around the year 1000 after the breaking, this pact was put to the test when hordes of Trollocs poured out of the Blight and overran many of the nations at the time. Aramella, despite being one of the largest and most powerful nations in the world, was completely destroyed by the Trollocs, and its capital, Mafal de Darnell, was completely razed. In the aftermath of the Trolloc Wars, four nations would arise from the ruins of Aramella. Ramdashar, El Salam, Romella, and Oberun. The lands that Malkir would lie in would be a part of the fledgling nation of Ramdashar. Ramdashar would stay a nation until the turbulent times at the end of the Free Years, when a young king named Arthur Paindrag Tanriol, who would later be known as Arthur Hawkwing, would conquer all of the nations of the Westlands, including Ramdashar. He split Ramdashar into a few provinces to help govern such a vast territory, and one of these provinces was called Malkir. And it sat the farthest north of any of the Empire's territory, and served as the first barrier against the forces of the Shadow. In 994 of the Free Years, Arthur Hawkwing died, leaving a power vacuum, and his empire began to fall apart. Hawkwing's governor for Malkir, Shivar Jamela, declared the province of Malkir to be a sovereign nation very early on in the Hundred Years' War that occurred after Hawkwing's death. Malkir forged alliances with other borderland provinces to fight the Shadow, keeping the northern part of the Westlands out of the wars that ravaged the rest of the continent for people fighting over Hawkwing's empire. For the next thousand years, Malkir would fight the Shadow back and hold the border of the Blight, with their other borderland allies, Shinar, Kandor, Arafel, and Saldea. In 954 of the New Age, Alakir Mandragoran served as the king of Malkir. Now his brother Lane Mandragoran, not to be confused with Lan, Lane Mandragoran, at the behest of his wife Brayan, due to a wager that she had made with someone else, took 5,000 Malkiri lancers into the Blight to show his bravery and martial skill. Now, rather than a triumph, Lane and all of his lancers were killed. Brayan blamed the king for not supporting Lane's adventure into the Blight, 
and began to plot to overthrow the king and have her son, who was named Isom, installed on the throne instead of Alakir. Brayan was supported by a popular and powerful Malkiri noble named Cohen Gamelin. Cohen was a popular figure in the kingdom and unknown to almost everyone, he was also a dark friend. And his support for the coup was actually a plot from the shadow. Now both sides were able to raise armies to fight and in the process, the forts along the Blight border were stripped to a bare minimum garrison to fight in the coup. Eventually, King Alakir Mandragoran's forces were victorious and defeated the traitors. Cohen Gamelin was captured by the famous Malkiri named Jane Charan, who would later be known as Jane Farstrider. If you want to know more about him, I did a video explaining his life, which I will have linked at the end of this video. Now, Jane brought Cohen Gamelin to the king, and the king defeated him in a one-on-one -on -one duel and killed him. However, while the border forts were stripped bare, a massive Trolloc army invaded and overran the forts. Seeing that there would be no time for help to arrive before the entire nation would be overrun, King Mandragoran abdicated the throne and sent his two-year-old son, Lan Mandragoran, with 20 of Malkir's best swordsmen and gave them the mission of getting Lan to safety in Faldara in Shinar. He gave Lan the sword of the Malkiri kings, which had been passed down from rulers dating all the way back to the time of Aramella. Alakir Mandragoran then led what remained of the Malkiri forces into a last stand at Herod's Crossing, where his army was decimated, but it did buy time for the 20 Malkiri to fight through fewer Trollocs on their way to Shinar. This also bought time for the remaining borderland nations to rally their defenses and push back the Shadow's advance at the Stairs of Jahan. However, the damage was done. Malkir was completely overrun and its people were all either scattered or killed. The capital of Malkir, the Seven Towers, was in rubble and the nation was no more. Shinar, which had previously not been considered a full borderland nation as it did not share a border with the Blight, became a new borderland nation and forts were built along its boundaries to protect against the area that was once Malkir. Of the 20 men that were sent to protect land Mandragoran, only five survived the journey to Faldara in Shinar, and those five that remained alive taught Lan the sword and raised him in the Shinar and city of Faldara. Lan adopted the Malkir oath to stand against the shadow so long as iron is hard and stone abides, to defend the Malkiri while one drop of blood remains, to avenge what cannot be defended. He would take this on as a war that he knew he could not win, but he knew one day he would attempt to retake his homeland. Malkir would sit in the ever-creeping blight until 998 of the New Age when Moraine Damadred, Lan Mandragoran, and a party of people from Emmons Field passed through what was once Malkir on their way to the Eye of the World. Close to three years later, Lan Mandragoran, supported by his wife Nynaeve Almira, would raise the Golden Crane, the battle flag for Malkir, and he would ride across the borderlands raising an army in the process. Land and his army rode towards Tarwin's Gap and a war to retake Malkir. They were later joined by the combined forces of all of the borderlands sent by the Dragon Reborn as part of the last battle. And although this force was eventually pushed back to the fields of Marilor, the Shadow was eventually defeated and the Dark One's prison sealed. The Blight disappeared and Malkir was free once more. It can be presumed that Lan and his wife Nynaeve re-established the kingdom of Malkir after the completion of the story. There is not a ton of information on Malkiri culture and its population, but it can be assumed that it wasn't a massively populated nation. First of all, being in one of the most inhospitable parts of the habited world, it probably did not have a ton of people living there, as mostly it's in the mountains and the blight is right there. The largest city in its capital was called Malkir, but was frequently referred to as the Seven Towers due to the seven massive towers that dominated the city's skyline. There are not very many cities that we know of in Malkir other than the capital. The people of Malkir were similar to the other borderland nations in that they possessed a warrior culture and glorified battle and defense of humankind against the shadow. All Malkiri were trained in combat as war was a part of everyday life there. Malkiri men were given a hadori at the age of 16, which is a thin strip of braided leather that holds their hair back. This names a Malkiri boy a man, and often at that age, Malkiri boys would recite the oath of the Malkiri, which we talked about earlier. The Malkiri have a very strong sense of honor and dedication to their cause, again, most likely fueled by the intensity of the struggle to survive when your nation borders the Blight and is always at war with Trollocs. This honor and sense of dedication seems to have lasted long after the fall of the nation, as many come to Land's side when he raised the Golden Crane. Now, there are a number of notable Malkiri in the story, 
First, we've already mentioned Leanne Mandragoran and Jane Charin, who would later be known as Jane Farstrider. Another notable Malkiri is Isom, who is one half of the hybrid Shadow Spawn creation Slayer. Isom is Lan's cousin, and Isom's mother was the one who attempted to overthrow Lan's father and have Lan killed. Isom and his mother were captured by the forces of the Shadow during the invasion of Malkir, and Isom later became a dangerous tool for the Shadow. Malkir lies just to the north of Shinar, at the very north of the non-shadow-controlled lands of the Westlands. Much of its lands lie in the Mountains of Doom, and the nation is considered to be mostly a mountainous country. Malkir lies right about 250 miles from Sheogul itself. There are a couple of other notable geographical features to Malkir. First, the area surrounding the capital and the Seven Towers was known as the Thousand Lakes, as it had lots of lakes. Duh. Additionally, Tarwin's Gap lies within the boundaries of Malkir. Tarwin's Gap is a pass through the Mountains of Doom that narrows to a very small area, which makes it easy to defend against much larger armies. The Borderlands have used this place as a choke point to fight large forces of Trollocs for years. Again, not much is known about the economy of Malkir. We don't have much information on everyday life there, but there are a couple things that we can assume based on the geography and the economy of Shinar, which is Malkir's closest neighbor. Given that the area is very mountainous, it can be assumed that mining and ores were a big part of the Malkiri economy, perhaps precious gemstones as well. Now, this is true for other borderland nations, so it follows that it would be true for Malkir as well. There's also evidence that farmable land and water around the area of the capital would mean that there was probably a good amount of farming done there as well. The government of Malkir was a hereditary monarchy, with the ruler's title passing down to the former ruler's children. There also appear to have been rulers of individual noble houses that have political power within the country as well. So the government of Malkir appears to share similar structure with most of the governments of the Westlands in that it's a feudal monarchy with a good deal of freedom for the people. They don't seem to be too oppressed. It's unclear if Malkir could have had queens or if the ruler was always a king. Nearby Shinar has had queens in the past, and the other borderland nations have as well, so it's probably safe to assume that a monarch is not strictly a patriarchy. The military of Malkir was once considered to be quite formidable. They were among the most battle-tested soldiers in the world, given their proximity to Sheogul, and the constant war with the Shadow meant that their fighters were always fighting. It's unlikely that Malkir could field a massive military, but a very well-trained, very well-equipped, smaller army is more likely. They could muster most likely around 50 to 80,000 troops, like the other borderland nations, if their population was similar in size, but it's also likely that Malkir had a smaller population just due to its mountainous terrain. We do know that many great sword fighters have come from Malkir, including Lan Mandragoran, and the five Malkiri that raised him and trained him. All were said to be incredible with the sword and a testament to the Malkiri people. So I don't think it can be stated that Malkir was an extremely powerful nation as it was mainly focused on its war with the Shadow, so it wasn't like an economic or political powerhouse in the world. They did have a strong military, they had a stable government, at least until the end, and a solid economy that supported the nation. But they were not the most powerful in any of these areas. However, the idea of Malkir, or its memory, became very powerful after its fall. There was a great guilt and sadness among the remaining borderland nations at the loss of one of their own, and many swore oaths to follow the Golden Crane or to reclaim the lands of Malkir if the Golden Crane was ever raised again. This is evidenced by the large army of former Malkiri and other borderlanders that Lan Mandragoran was able to raise simply by riding across the borderlands with the Golden Crane raised. There are really only two significant landmarks that we can recognize from the story. First is a natural landmark, and that is Tarwin's Gap. The gap is present in the story multiple times and serves as a choke point for the forces of the light to fight the Shadow and Trollocs uh, invading from the Blight. It's a natural canyon that narrows to a point where it negates the larger number of Trollocs and makes the fights easier to survive for the forces of the light. The second landmark is the capital itself, the Seven Towers. Although the capital was actually called Malkir, just like the nation, 
It came to be known as the Seven Towers for the defining seven towers that loomed over the city. They are briefly seen in the eye of the world, although they are in ruins at this point. Malkir doesn't necessarily play a major role in the story, although it does give some very real and very meaningful backstory to the fight against the Shadow, and to one of our main characters in Land Van Dragoran, and of course, Jane Farstrider. The story of Malkir gives us an example of the Shadow doing real damage and shows the gravity of the fight in the Borderlands. The fact that an entire nation could be wiped from the map less than 45 years prior to the start of the story gives real stakes when fighting the Shadow. Additionally, the raising of the Golden Crane by Land Mandragoran and the recruiting efforts of his wife Nynaeve Almira to follow her husband on his quest to reclaim and avenge Malkir is one of the highlights of the story for many. I've talked about this on the channel before. The scene where Nynaeve recruits the Malkiri man uh, is a tearjerker for many and one of the highlights for her character and I think of the books. Malkir represents what was lost but also the hope of what can be reclaimed or avenged and serves as a motivating force for Lan and the other Borderlanders as they move towards the last battle. Uh, asking what comes after for Malkir is an interesting question, as the Shadow has been defeated. I think it would be fair to assume that the Malkiri would retake their land, and it would be ruled again by their king, Lan Mandragoran, and his Aes Sedai queen, Nynaeve Almira. Now, there's no longer a shadow to fight, so the mantra and ethos of the nation would likely change as well. It's possible that rather than being a military society, Malkir would become more agrarian and a mining nation, and its remoteness from the politics of the rest of the world would keep it isolated and somewhat safe from warfare should the dragon's peace fall apart. There should be stability in the ruling line as well, as Nynaeve Almira as queen would live for possibly up to another 750 years, as she's an exceptionally powerful channeler, that is assuming she retires and frees herself from the Three Oaths. I see a peaceful existence for the residents of Malkir in the future. So that's it, my examination of Malkir. What do you guys think? Is there anything that I left out? Please let me know in the comments below. Also, big thank you again to Yuri and Stonebow for sponsoring this video. Please check out my Patreon if you're interested in sponsoring a video of your own or supporting me in other ways. Make sure to check out the channel's other sponsors in the description below, and that would be NordVPN and Audible.com, and check out the offers that they're throwing your way. Other than Patreon, that's literally the best way to support the channel. And then, of course, you can always shop Wheel of Time stuff at shopwheeloftime.com. That link is in the description below as well. Please hit the like button if you like the video, and smash that subscribe button if you enjoy Wheel of Time content, because that's pretty much all I make here, uh, and we're going to have a lot of cool stuff lined up for you. I know many of you are still not subscribed and you watch regularly. If you don't mind, make sure to really subscribe as it does help the channel grow, even if you're watching the videos already. Thanks a ton. Hey guys, thanks for watching, and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?